Hey folks, we've got a lot, believe it or not, to do today. Uh, we are got three sermons left in our series on Philippians, the Church of Joy. All right? And then also today, I want to remind you that we, we plan to take a love offering, and the love offering is for our trip for Romania, and it's for uh, basically building a house, okay? And uh, Pete kind of announced about it last week. Actually, we had a few of the teenagers and also the college uh, talked about it. So we're going to take a love offering first. And so my goal is to get you out of here at 10 after. You say, wow, they look at, they look at excitement in the eyes. Don't, yeah, they, it ain't that easy. Then what's going to happen is at, at 10 after, we're going to take a love offering. And then we're going to ask our, everybody to be dismissed. But of the new member or our members, we need to hang around because we're going to have a vote today. We've had two business meetings on Sunday since I've been here for 11 years. This is our second one. It's very unusual, but we, whenever we're looking at, uh, and it's actually looking at calling a pastor, we always have the, a meeting on a Sunday because that's when our biggest attendance is. So with that in mind, if you go with me to the book of Philippians. And today we're going to look at what is a healthy church. Now, you know, that little skit that uh, me and... Uh, Phil did, and I I appreciate Phil because I threw that at him like five minutes before I started, literally, didn't I, Phil? Uh, But he's always good about uh, playing along, and I'm very thankful for that. But one of the things that's sad, there was a lot of truth to that hillbilly from West Virginia. There have been church splits over some of the stupid issues. One was a picture of Jesus in the church. Which one to use? That's an actual story, okay? One was carpet, okay? Some of you all have been around the block a long time, and you guys know that there are some of the stupidest things that we fight over in the name of Christ. Well, in the book of Philippians, Paul is dealing with a church that he loves, and he tells, number one word, what is the number one word in this book? Oh, come on. This is you guys. Joy. Joy. Man, when our kids used to sing, joy, 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 we'd get them excited. Yo, sound like y'all just somebody took the candy out of your candy bowl or something like that. The word joy is used over 14 times. Paul is using it when he's talking about when he's in prison, in on guard, being chained 24-7 in the worst prison in Rome. He is basically on support from whatever church congregations send him for his care because in prison they do not feed you in the Roman uh, Empire. So the church of Philippi was a church that he, that loved Paul. Matter of fact, he, he basically started, and it was started, you know, he's always talk about the church fathers. You know what started at the church of Philippi? It was the church mothers. There's basically 10 women. Paul went outside the city that morning and he was, the the reason is it only took 10 guys to form a synagogue in any kind of city. All right? 10 guys. They didn't have 10 guys in Philippi. So he ended up going down the river. He found these girls that were praying. One of them was Lydia. And he sat there and this prayer meeting is what birthed this church of a jailer, of a demon-possessed Girl, and also of Lydia. And this church became a very structured church. And it was going through some tribulation, but it had, and Paul was sitting there saying, guys, listen, as much as going on in my life, as painful as these things are, you got to have joy. I want to look at what is or what makes up a healthy church. What makes up a healthy church? This is a very important thing to answer. First of all, There are five signs, and I want you to go with me to Philippians chapter 4, and they are found in the first five verses. And I hope you brought your pen, because I really want you to underline these, all right? Now let's look at them. It says, Therefore, my beloved, and longed for brother, my joy, my crown, stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore you, Odia, and I implore Sintike to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labor with me in the gospel. 
with Clement also, and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Let's, let, let's right now gather and let's just pray, okay? Father, today these folks have came for a word from God. Father, I want each one of them to receive a word from you. We could all get a general word. Sometimes we get a word that's just specifically to us. It just sits there and it rings our bell. It sits there and it sets it off because, Father, Lord, the Spirit is cracking our hearts. I'm asking right now, God. It's amazing me how an amazing God you are. I sit there and I take Philippians and I think I've been attacked the most I have in the ministry. And I think you know exactly what we need at the right time and I think that's why you gave me this book to do right now. I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you that, Father, you know what's best. You're the great physician. You know what's in our life and, Father, you know what we need. So this morning we come before you and we're asking We're pleading. We're asking that you sit there and you penetrate our hearts so we see you the way that we're supposed to. Not some physical way or some way that Father Lord doesn't mount a hill of beans, but Father, we meet Jesus today. Father, we need you. It's not done, Father, by might. It's not by powers, but by the Spirit, saith the Lord. So Father, we call, not because we, 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 we call on you like you're some genie. We call on you because you're the king. You're the God. You're the alpha. You're the omega. And Father, your name deserves to be praised. So Lord, may we lift it up today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I look at these verses, and the first thing that I want you to see right away is one of the biggest things of a healthy church is a big heart. It is a big heart. It is a heart that has compassion. We have grown up in a lot of time where I tell you what, a lot of us don't have compassion. I tell you, as a chaplain, and I do a lot of death notifications, I sometimes do a lot of domestics. And your patience level or your, for suicides, you get a little cold to it. You get cold to because you see so much of it. Because I go view the body and I go tell the family. And you start getting cold. Many of us are that way in our lives. We get cold to the people around us. We get cold to the ones that love us the most. But because we're just so tired of hearing the same thing over and over and over again. That we get cold to it. Well look at Paul here. I love Paul here. Look what he says here. He says... Therefore, my beloved, Paul uses four things here. I want you to notice, and I highlighted them for you. My beloved, underline that. Next, long for brethren, my joy and my crown. Paul sits there, and he uses these four things, and he shows a loving heart of a leader. Paul loved these people. That word beloved, it means... Object of one's affection. It means, in the Greek, these people were the apple of Paul's eye. He thought about them constantly. They were on his mind. He had a great love for them. See, pastors need to love their churches. Any pastor that doesn't love their church is useless. Any of you that have got to the point where you've got so cold and you don't love the people of God, you become useless. And sometimes you and I need to sit there, and that's why in the book of Ephesians it says, return unto me my first love. Okay? Because sometimes we lose it. Notice the second thing he says, longed for brother. Now, I ain't a great mathematician. You want to see how I figured this out? You ready? He knew them 10 years. Okay? Ten years Paul knew them. And Paul during... I just spit on the front row. Paul... (laughs) Splash guard. Here we go. 
Paul was basically away for them for five years. But he's talking about he longs for them. He longs for them like, you know what? He just misses them so bad. It's that great of a love. This one where he says, my beloved brethren, where this thing that I was telling you about how he loves. You know what? The Bible says this, by this we will all know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. You know what? Some of you are going to disagree with me. Truth is not the most important thing in church. I'm going to give you another one. Holiest, holiness is not the most important thing. <gasps> the greatest thing the Bible says is love. Okay? Why? Because you know what? You and I, there is no way that you and I can go out and tell somebody about the love of God and the love of the gospel when you and I can't express the love of God and the gospel. What you've got to know, you be able to got to express. When you love God, the truth is going to be there. When you love God, holiness is going to be there. I've seen a lot of churches with a lot of truth and they're dead. That's why sometimes, well, we need another Bible study. No, you need to find out what you know and get out there. Amen. Oh, we need another Bible study. Yeah. Some of you young ones that are new in Christ, yeah, we need to drill it into you. Some of you guys have been saved 30 years. You don't need it. You need to take what you got and go to the fields. Preach it, pastor. Because that's the truth. It's the love that's going to change them. It's not the knowledge. You can have all the knowledge you want. You've got to take that love. Why does Paul say that? Because I tell you what, in this world, people don't believe because we worship an invisible God. Think about it. What do you think all the idolatry people in the Old Testament? Oh, man, there's a statue. At least I know what I can worship. All right? We worship a society that says, you know what? You guys that worship God, basically you're weak, okay? You, you, you guys don't have too much going on for you. You need, you need a crutch, all right? But you know what love does? And I want you to look at this verse and write it down. 1 John 4, 12 says, No one has seen God at any time. But if we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. That word perfected means displayed. See, that's when God's love takes the invisible and makes him visible in people's lives. When you love people that ain't too deserving of love, it rocks their world. My father, when he was an alcoholic, didn't understand how people like Elmer Potter, John Purnett would even talk to him is because of things that his past. But see, love puts you on a different level because when you and I express God's love, we know that we were slaves to sin. And we know that we were in the past. All we are is a bunch of wrecks in here, guys. Don't you get it? I don't care if you're a homosexual or a liar. All right? You're all level at the cross. And so when you and I sit there and we express God's love, we're expressing that, God, you know what? That doesn't mean we condone sin, but we're sitting there saying, you know what? God gives us something. When people look, they could see God. That's Paul, what's Paul saying, my beloved. That's what he's saying, long suffering for brethren. I want to keep, uh, real quick, in the same verse, he says, my joy. He says, my joy. My joy is basically a reference, you know, folks. He's saying this. His joy was wrapped up in them. That word crown, my crown, that wasn't a crown of being a dictator. Paul was heavy into what? I told you he would have been a what fan? Ohio State. Okay? He was big in the sports. Paul, the word he used there, crown, is the reef that you got displayed at Olympic Games. 
It was, they didn't get trophies. They didn't get contracts saying, hey, you know what? You're going to, you know, uh, be doing for chariot companies. He got, they got a reef and it said, you know what? You're the winner. Paul's saying, listen, it's all they got, but it meant the most to them. Paul's saying, you know what? You guys are my crown. He says, I don't need anything else. He says, you're my icing on the cake, man. See, the church, the number one ingredient of a healthy church is it's got a big heart. Folks, if your heart's grown cold, you need to get a transplant. We talked about hearts last week, but I tell you what, I know a great physician. They may not transplant a lot of things today, but the Lord can transplant and he could put a new heart in you. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today's the day. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and hearts got cold, you know what? It can be brought back alive in beating. The second thing we see in this is, you know what? A church needs to have a very big heart, but it also needs to counteract that. It needs to be able to stand firm. Notice in uh, verse 1, and I call it B, but I want you to look at it. He says, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. The word stand fast is a, Greek, is a Roman military term. It means no retreat. It means you ain't backing up no matter what. What's he talking about that? Why is Paul bringing them up? He says this. We need to heal division in people. With deep convictions. We need to take a firm stance and a big heart to follow God no matter what. Sometimes people come in my office and they ask me. And I start off with a counseling question that kind of rocks their world sometimes. I ask them, what event would stop you from following Christ? Would it be a loss of a child? What about the loss of a spouse? What about a spouse that sits there and just decides to walk away? What about health? See, this word here in the Greek means there's no backing up. There's no other plan. It means that's all I've got. Folks, I wish I could sit there and tell you I... I wish I could tell you I'm always strong. I'm not. I get knocked down my can quite a bit. This last two months has probably been one of the greatest times in my Christian walk. It's also been one of the hardest times in my Christian walk. (laughs) He's taught me something. He's taught me that, you know what? I can't compromise which I had a tendency to do, and I justified it. Yeah, I had a tendency to say, you know what? The good outweighs the bad. And I can rationalize off in it. But the more I interpret the word of God, there's no turning back. You have to take a stand. There's some folks in our congregation have taken stands and it is hurt. It's divided their family. You say, well, that's not right. Jesus Christ sat there and said, you know what? I came to separate families. Being a Christian sometimes costs you something. See, y'all have got to the point where Christianity don't cost anything. But if you're living for Christ, there's a cost. Don't ever forget that. There's a cost. Third thing that we see, third thing that we see is a warm embrace. A warm embrace. Go with me to verse 2. It says, I implore Euodia, I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. There are two ladies in this church. Now, it's not a doctrinal issue. You say, how do you know that? Paul's talked doctrine already. This is some kind of personal issue behind between two women. Yodia, her name means good trip. All right? And Sinteki, her name means lucky. So I'm going to call them Miss Good Trip and Miss Lucky because I'm pronouncing the other names pretty poorly. All right? 
So Mrs. Goodtrip and Mrs. Lucky have some kind of disagreement at the church at Philippi, which at that point, everybody is taking sides. Now, these two women also were probably the ones that were some of the founding mothers of that church, the ones I told you that prayed. Paul even sits there and says, hey, I also help these women who labored with me. These were some good folks. And they probably had good arguments or good, basically, things on each side of their ideas. But folks, sometimes it isn't that big of a deal. When it's doctrine, we die on it. When it's chairs or pews, it ain't a big deal. When it's a color of carpet, it ain't a big deal. See, these folks, as long as 2,000 years since this was written, these two ladies are mentioned of having some church dispute. Let me ask you something. We have a, we have a time capsule out there, buried, when this church hit 50. When it's dug up, there's Twinkies in there. I put them in there. I dare the pastor at that time to eat them. You know what I'm saying? Isaiah, Isaiah Spence and a little Philip Potter Jr. said they would take the bite, you know. There's a lot of things in that capsule. But let me ask you something. If 100 years from now, something had to be written about you, one line, what would you want? I don't think I'd want to be known for a church split. I don't think I'd want to be known as a person that was, did not have a big heart. I don't think I'd want to be known as a compromiser. In these writings here, these ladies, it's interesting that the solution is found in this verse. I don't want you to overlook this. Please look at this verse. Notice what it says. I implore. The word implore is a command in the Greek. Do you understand me? In other words, that's not a suggestion. Okay? Sometimes people get mad at our deacons, or sometimes they get mad at the pastor because we sit there and say, this is the way it has to be. Leadership, everything, and I've said this over and over, rises and falls on leadership. Folks, you've got fallen in some imperfect leadership in this church. But on God's holy word, my men, in me, I tell you what, I'm proud of them because I tell you what, we really do seek the Lord. And we're going to be accountable for PBC, at least for the time that we're here. In this command, he's saying, listen, I ain't giving you a choice. He's saying, I'm imploring you. I, he says, ladies, he said, I don't care. And he says for a reason. It's brilliant when you look at it. Notice what he says. He says, I want you, okay, to have the same mind in the Lord. Circle that word, same mind in the Lord. Paul sits there and says, these issues of social and puts them to spiritual. He says, guys, if it's in Jesus' court, what would you be doing? He says, basically, you know what? He puts Jesus in the picture. You know what happens in a lot of people when they're fighting? You know what happens when a lot of people are screaming? You know what happens when we're angry, when we're mad? We forget Jesus. He's out of the picture. Come on, tell the truth, shame the devil. You tell me when you're sitting there screaming down somebody... Or you're yelling at somebody or you're mad at somebody. Jesus is even in there? He's not, folks. And Paul sits there and says, "Uh uh-uh. He says, you bring Jesus into the picture. He says, you bring Jesus. He says, Paul sits there and says the most important. You know what? I was reading uh, a study. I like orchestras. We have a gentleman in our church that actually plays in the orchestra. And... um, He's in the, he plays a violin. Well, there was a study out of Chicago, okay? 
that was done by Chicago. Um, I think it was DePaul University. Don't quote me which college. But they did a quick study on basically the uh, Chicago Orchestra. And they said, well, the percussionists all are considered to be know-it-alls, pretentious, and half-decent at what they do. All right? The violinists are way out of shape physically, okay? (laughs) Physically can't compete, and they're kind of lazy, all right? And then they said some bad things about the brass and all these different things. Now, it's interesting, and these were the individuals talking about the other parts of the orchestra. But you know, then it comes up. They may not get along, but I tell you what, the day they get together to play in front of people, all of a sudden that conductor gets up there and they create beautiful music. Why? Because they don't care what, if that person's a Democrat or Republican, they don't care what they're, they just do what they've been assigned by the conductor. This word here, where it says, right here, it says, in verse 4, he said, in verse 4, and please forgive me, I, I lost my place. I apologize. Uh, my mind goes and I apologize. Same mind in the Lord. It's the idea of bringing our thoughts under control of Jesus. It's putting our own personal desires. There was a lady in this church named Georgia Peach. And Georgia Peach didn't vote for me. I liked her right away. Okay, when I first came to this church, she wanted stained glass windows. She was a southern belle, as southern as you can get. But I tell you what, she got finally. She got to the point in her life where she changed and she said, you know what, stained glasses ain't going to keep the kids coming. We got to get this young generation. So she put a lot of her wants aside. And so didn't a lot of folks here at this church. And put things past and realize, you know what? Something's bigger than my own preferences. The gospel of Jesus Christ and how to reach a new generation. So that's what we have to do in these circumstances. Let's look at four and I'm almost done. All right? Unity among Christians proves the veracity of the Christian message. Proves the truth of it. Real quick. Fourth ingredient. First one was what? A big heart. Second was what? Stand firm. What was the third one? Big embrace. What was the fourth one? Merry soul. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Paul says, you know what? Whatever you're going through this morning, whatever circumstance, if you feel like you're against the wall, rejoice. You give God praise. You know where victories come? When you praise the Lord. You know, Nothing can stop God. Nothing. Some of you say, I don't feel God. Do you want to go through some trials? (laughs) You want to feel God? Well, I don't want to feel him that way. Guys, the only way you're going to feel God is when your back's against the wall and you cannot do nothing except say, Lord, help me, just like Peter said. That's it. All you could do is put up your arms like this and sit there and say, Lord, please help me. Because ain't nothing else. Oh, you got friends? Yeah, we got friends. We got good people in this church. I got good people in my life surrounding me. But in spite of that all, it comes down to God. Come on. It is. And if you haven't, and you're young, and you haven't experienced it way, you will. I promise you, you will. But instead of sitting there and looking at it as horrible, as adversity, adversity is not bad. Adversity is opportunity turned inside out. And the person with the most adversity has the most opportunity to sit there and give God praise. You and I have got to understand that we have an opportunity here. Don't jump out of it. Stay in exactly where God wants you to be. Rejoice in the Lord. Paul said there, joy is a personal choice to react to life's uncertainties by faith. How can I be joyful? Happiness is not joyful. 
happiness. Different words. Happiness is based on your circumstances. Joyfulness is knowing that, you know what? God is working. And he's going to finish that work. Second Corinthians says this. Paul says, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing all things. He's saying, listen, man, I tell you, the cupboard's bare. But you know what? God's got me covered. God's got me covered. Real quick, I'm going to go to my last point. I'm running out of time. Fifth, a soft touch. Soft touch. Let your gentleness be made known unto God. Look at verse 5. Let your gentleness be made known unto God. This word gentleness basically in the Greek means sweet reasonableness. It means it's like carrying a bucket of mercy. Let me just say this real quick. Many times I've met any of us that have been saved a long time, we get cold. And when we see newbies come in, new Christians, we don't have much patience with them. You know? We see kids that jumping up, dancing or something like that. It's like, man, how could they even do that? Well, probably because we're so old and we can't move. You know what? You want to jump over a chair, give God praise? I don't care. All right? Don't break anything and don't sue us. All right? The point I'm trying to make is, you know what? Don't worry about the small stuff like that. Give people a little slack in their Christian walk. You come alongside them. You don't sit there and give them a bunch of rules and regulations and make them into the Pharisee that we are. What do you want, to create a few more Pharisees? That ain't it. He uses a phrase here. He says, let your gentleness be made known to all men. And then he finishes, the Lord is at what? Hand. All right. What he basically means is this. The Lord is in your congregation. Now, I'm going to shut up right there. i got to close off because we got some other things we got to do. I just want to say, I I tell you what, I love this church, but I don't love it as much as Jesus Christ because he gave his blood for you. And I hope you love the people here, but guys, listen to me. Sometimes I think we're getting stagnant. Sometimes I just don't think that we're just, we're going through the motion. Some of you all, I can find us on a milk carton. i got to explain milk carton. In the old days when you couldn't find a kid, it was on a cardboard milk carton. I said that the other day, and a girl goes, what's that mean? You know, it's, yeah, all right? Some of you I can find maybe once a month. Sometimes, you know what? How do you expect to get God by that kind of schedule? you got to be in there daily. If not, you'll never reach where God wants you to be. And you're going to sit there and say, why? 